few years ago, I worked on a project that used a collection of medical notes kept by an astrological physician who practiced in England from the end of the 1500s into the mid-1600s. Each appointment the doctor recorded began with him writing down the question that his patient asked. He would then draw up an astrological chart to search for a diagnosis or cure in the stars. He largely served the poor, and over half his appointments were with women. Considering these demographics, most of his patients were likely unable to read or write and are not recorded in the historical record in any traditional sense. But because of the way that early modern understandings of the body did not separate physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual symptoms, the questions asked tend to include details from all of these. So for people who were not really recorded by history, we still have a window into some of their most interior thoughts. I looked at these patient questions to look at how sense of self was conceptualized and constructed, and how individual articulations of the world fit into but often clash with how we view early modern people, but there's a whole subset of these records that focus on the ideas and desires that people feel demons and evil spirits are putting into their head. Ideas and desires that one must assume they would not have felt comfortable expressing as simply their own. Wanting to commit suicide, for example, feeling that their husband's physical abuse had gone past the point that was reasonable, mourning for too long after the death of a child, belief that their milk kept curdling because they'd been cursed by a neighbor for not taking them up on an offer to bake together, many accusations of witchcraft from the time follow similar lines. Patients approached the doctor with fears of demonic possession and interference and described to him some of the most fundamental pains of daily life. Demons and evil spirits have always been a way of discussing our own darkness without betraying too much to ourselves or others. Monsters in our own heads or living next door have always been a window into real-world suffering, anxiety, and conflict. The slasher as a genre was not given much critical attention or analysis initially. Carol Clover's 1992 book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film, has become a foundational text for anyone looking at horror, but until she was dared to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre in theaters, she hadn't considered the genre to have much value either. Her assumptions on the nature of the male gaze and the functions of female victims on screen were challenged by the movie. She obsessively rented exploitation horror and rape revenge films, surveying video store owners on the demographics of the viewership. While her idea of the final girl, a term she coined for the female victim hero of these films, has been taken and idealized into a feminist icon, her initial conception is less optimistic. She offers several readings of the role of this character, but more than any one thing, she did find that lowbrow horror, slashers in particular, are not the presumed to be sadistic exercise of male audiences who want to see women tortured. A common thread to her readings is that a female body allows male audiences a more palatable figure through which they can experience fear and taboo desire than they would normally be open to. Clover asks, what has made ghost stories and fairy tales crucial enough to pass along? its engagement of repressed fears and desires, and its reenactment of the residual conflict surrounding those feelings. The formulaic and often unsophisticated nature of the slasher provides a clear baseline to explore this engagement and reenactment. Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's thesis, The Monster Dwells at the Gates of Difference, posits that the monster seeks out its author to bear witness to the fact that it could have been constructed otherwise. Coming back to Halloween, there are countless ways to read Michael across this franchise, but I personally like seeing him this way as bearing witness, a specter of Haddonfield's pain stalking its streets and demanding to be recognized and reckoned with is very compelling. That it may latch onto Lori either by chance or some hidden connection works for me. I think like with anything, you can find meaning and explanation as deep as you want to go. I personally prefer the movies don't go down this route, but we can have fun here and observe that Lori starts the movie with the keys to the Myers house. Her father's the realtor, and in his own way, Michael has been dispossessed of his home. Lori's the keeper of what he's lost, and so in that way, we have a self and an other, shadow and double. I mean, you could really get carried away with it. You could throw in Michael's life in an asylum, the impending shutdown of mental health facilities across the U.S. under Reagan, and the associated surge of homelessness and dehumanization of the unhoused concurrent to the rest of the franchise as Michael tries over and over to return to his childhood home. Pulling in the newest movies, you could take the reactionary fear of crime surging in the 70s after the Manson murders and backdropping Halloween 1978, and look at the podcasters in Halloween 2018 who could represent the contemporary glut of true crime which will have its own inevitable conservative pro-policing backlash. This reading of dispossession of the other, of repression and sublimated unease, relies on some concepts that have ingrained themselves in our thinking via psychoanalysis. Whether or not one may believe in psychoanalytic theory in any modern sense, they are ideas and concepts that we make and view movies through because of how deeply they've saturated our recent culture. I don't think that they're by any means 
isn't the right way to interpret all horror, but I also don't think that there's any one right way, period. Jack Halberstam in Parasites and Perverts, An Introduction to Gothic Monstrosity, sums up a main pitfall of this mode of thought as doomed to reproduce the process it attempts to explain. He also finds that psychoanalysis, with its emphasis on and investments in the normal, quickly reveals itself to be inadequate to the task of unraveling the power of horror, as monstrosity always unites monstrous form with monstrous meaning. Keeping that in mind, but also considering the background we do have from Michael, aka life in an asylum after murdering his naked sister and some confused sexual repression, I think that the psychoanalytic concepts at the core of a lot of 20th century horror theory are a good place to start. Now, the language of psychoanalysis and analysis of horror of this period is of course written in less fluid terms than we would use at the moment, and knowing the direction that some of the strain of gender theory went with regard to fighting against trans rights, there are certain alarm bells that go off. There's a lot of gender and anatomical essentialism at work, but I think we can also get a lot from the less literal social implications of readings such as the final girl is reconstituted by her struggles into a phallicized figure. Regardless of the connotations that we may have with this vocabulary, in many ways this is the language of these early slashers. If there's any doubt that psychoanalysis flooded the making of Halloween, Clover quotes John Carpenter's denial that his film punished female sexuality. The one girl who's the most sexually uptight just keeps stabbing this guy with a long knife. She's the most sexually frustrated. She's the one that killed him, not because she's a virgin, but because all that repressed energy starts coming out. She uses all those phallic symbols on the guy. She and the killer have a certain link, sexual repression. In any case, time-specific articulations of gender are not beside the point. A major thrust of Carol Clover's essay, Her Body Himself, is in exploring how the horror of the slasher film often expresses a pre-modern sense of gender and sex. The sublimated anxiety and desire experienced by the audience, then, may speak to something that we haven't yet, in decades of analysis and theory, found a way to adequately articulate. Maybe for the reasons that Morris Dickstein identifies low horror to be the genre most likely to be trade by artistic treatment and lavish production values, slashers have an ability to cut past our own knowledge of ourselves as understood either in 1992 when Clover published Men, Women, and Chainsaws or today. Undergirding all of the above is the idea of repression. Now, on the subject of time-specific articulation, psychoanalysis speaks in very certain terms about repression. But repression and the surrounding cultural analysis is very important to our discussion here. Repression is summed up efficiently by Robin Wood in his introduction to the American American horror film, what is repressed is not accessible to the conscious mind. He elaborates, one might perhaps define repression as fully internalized oppression while reminding ourselves that all of the groundwork of repression is laid in infancy, thereby suggesting both the difference and the connection. A specific example may make this clearer. Our social structure demands the repression of the bisexuality that psychoanalysis shows to be the natural heritage of every human individual and the oppression of homosexuals. Obviously, the two phenomena are not identical, but equally obviously, they are closely connected. To the question of what is being repressed, he continues. First, sexual energy itself, together with its possible successful sublimation into non-sexual creativity, sexuality being the source of creative energy in general. The ideal inhabitant of our culture will be the individual whose sexuality is sufficiently fulfilled by the monogamous heterosexual union necessary for the reproduction of future ideal inhabitants and whose sublimated sexuality, creativity, is sufficiently fulfilled in the totally non-creative and non-fulfilling labor, whether in factory or office, to which our society dooms the overwhelming majority of its members. Some big claims there, but fun to read, and some solid groundwork for our franchise. When looking at horror, the uncanny is a familiar effect. Familiarity really is key. In his essay, The Uncanny, Freud tries to pin down the meaning of the word, Something familiar but made to be unfamiliar, something hidden from view. Disparate but related meanings bring him back to the old animistic conception of the universe, where we recognize something which is familiar and old established in the mind, and which has become alienated from it only through the process of repression. For the sense of the uncanny that we get when we're struck by the possibility of these animistic beliefs, he writes, Let us take the uncanny associated with the omnipotence of thoughts, with the prompt fulfillment of wishes with secret injurious powers and with the return of the dead. The condition under which the feeling of uncanniness arises here is unmistakable. 
We, or our primitive forefathers, once believed that these possibilities were realities, and were convinced that they actually happened. Nowadays, we no longer believe in them. We have surmounted these modes of thought, but we do not feel quite sure of our new beliefs, and the old ones still exist within us, ready to seize upon any confirmation. Freud quotes playwright Klinger in a line that evokes the unsettledness that can follow a horror movie, at times, I feel like a man who walks in the night and believes in ghosts. Maybe more than fear, this is the appeal of horror media. Horror can be that other reality peeking through that we catch a glimpse of sometimes but can't quite focus on. If I had to choose a favorite genre, it would probably be horror, but I could also probably count on one hand the number of movies that actually scare me. I think a lot of fans feel this way. I think, then, the experience has something to do with inviting uncanniness in, of welcoming home the very sense that something doesn't belong there. Now. In real life, I am so easily scared by any sense of the uncanny. When I let my dog out at night, I get so hyper aware of how visible I am under the porch light and how dark the trees around me are. I mean, my neighbors live like 15 feet away, but I get this rising primordial fear when I'm staring out into the night. The handful of trees around me feel like a forest and I convince myself I'm being watched from the darkness until I'm grabbing my dog and running us inside as fast as I can like a scared kid running up the basement stairs. But in a horror movie, it's the uncanniness that's at home. I'm the one lurking and bearing witness to the thing that I suspect is always there waiting for me to turn my back. Uncanniness depends on familiarity and horror is endlessly generative, recreating imagery from previous works, reworking the same moment over and over again, inventing its own uncanniness. As seen throughout Halloween, this genre lives in the accumulation of sequels, remakes, imitations. This is a field in which there is in some sense no original, no real or right text, but only variants. This uncanniness and tendency toward repetition is given form in Freud's conception of the double, as it is marked by the fact that the subject identifies himself with someone else so that he is in doubt as to which his self is, or substitutes the extraneous self for his own. In other words, there is doubling, dividing, and interchanging of the self. And finally, there is the constant recurrence of the same thing, the repetition of the same features or character traits or vicissitudes of the same crimes or even the same names through several consecutive generations. I mean, is there a genre that reuses names as often as horror? Bringing us back to the slasher, Robin Wood writes, The relationship between normality and the monster has one privileged form, the figure of the doppelganger, alter ego, or double. He adds that this motif reveals the monster as normality's shadow. The concept of the double can be viewed across Michael and Laurie's iterations. We see Laurie become Michael in Resurrection and Zombies Halloween 2. Whether or not there was a reason why Laurie was attacked originally, they are now linked. Whether brother and sister or not, we see the bond in various movies and strongly in Laurie's own worldview. As Wood says, the hero's drive is to destroy the doppelganger who embodies the repressed self. As Carpenter said, she and the killer have a certain link, sexual repression. This drive to cut away the embodiment of our own repression brings us to abjection. Abjection is a slippery idea concerning the disruption of identity, morality, and order. Trauma is experienced when we are forced to acknowledge the abject, which sits outside of these systems. Systems. Julia Kristeva expounded on the abject in her 1980 Powers of Horror, but at its most basic is her articulation of the abject as something rejected from which one does not part. On the nature of the self and the other, she writes, the abject appears in order to uphold I within the other. The abject is the violence of mourning for an object that has always already been lost. The abject shatters the walls of repression and its judgments. It takes the ego back to its source on the abominable limits from which, in order to be, the ego has broken away. It assigns it a source in the non-ego drive and death. Abjection is a resurrection that has gone through death of the ego. It is an alchemy that transforms death drive into a start of life, of new significance. The foundational separation of self and other, abject and its objects can be crossed in a phobic, obsessional, psychotic guise, or more generally and in more imaginary fashion in the shape of abjection, notifying us of the limits of our human universe. What Kristeva is approaching there is the idea of primal repression, and Kristeva's definition of primal repression gives us a reading of the way that Michael and Laurie are rewritten through these iterations. Let us call it the ability of the speaking being, always already haunted by the other, to divide, reject, repeat. This is a way to understand the internal logic of a franchise that continues rewriting itself but is never fully reset. 
This is a power of horror that is less served by today's filmmaking and its obsession with straightening out continuity. For Haddonfield, the Myers house is, in most movies, abandoned, derelict, unsellable. You dare your friends to run up to the stoop. Sometimes Loomis is lurking in the bushes to scare you. Hey, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. Surprisingly, Lonnie Elam and the question of the Myers house will come back in Halloween Kills. Forty years removed from the child version of Lonnie, he has become known for bravely going into the house on a dare. It turns out he's been lying about this his whole life. He'd always been too afraid, and his motivation to face Michael at the end of Kills is to finally live up to this version of himself he'd projected. A pretty flimsy motivation for driving yourself, your teenage son, and his ex-girlfriend to the place where you know Michael Myers is going to be, but that is Halloween Kills for you. In the original movie, Laurie's father is the realtor trying to sell the house. In part six, he's managed to get his brother to take the house cheap, which is the only time until Kills that we see it occupied. In Kills, of course, it's the home of the only queer characters I think we've seen in this entire franchise. A social abjection. The concept of abjection has been used a lot in queer theory. Throughout the franchise, the Myers house is a gaping reminder of what everyone in town tries to forget. And for Michael, we're led to believe that the house has different meaning. Putting aside his assumed desire to return home, Loomis in movies five and six insists that the house contains Michael's rage. This rage which drives you. You think if you kill them all, it will go away. You have to fight it in the place where it's strongest, where it all began. What makes you think he'll come back here? This house is sacred to him. He has all his memories here. His rage! Taking into account the sometimes sneaky boy, sometimes aggro incel, sometimes prank king that Michael appears as in different movies, there's not really a consistent way to read him across the franchise. Though it would be kind of fun to try like a unified theory of Michael. I do kind of like this weirdo idea that Loomis has that Michael's come home to access his rage. Kristeva gives us another way to read Michael's motivations. She writes, There are lives not sustained by desire, as desire is always for objects. Such lives are based on exclusion. Rage is not exclusion, and if Michael is living the repressed, sexually frustrated existence of 70s psychoanalytic extremism, then access to rage maybe is a way through. That emotion and some sense of a soul could be locked in his childhood home where he first killed his sister makes some kind of sense. As much sense as anything else in The Curse of Michael Myers, at least. But of course Michael doesn't like reclaim his rage or gain some kind of access to his emotions. In a slasher, we never actually reach the other side of repression. The world opens up and there's the possibility of a different kind of reality, but then the monster is vanquished, at least for now, and the status quo is reinstated. Looking forward to Halloween ends for a minute, I always feel a sense of dread toward the idea of an ending. Wood describes horror as being the actual dramatization of the dual concept of the repressed, the other, in the figure of the monster. One might say that the true subject of the horror genre is the struggle for recognition of all that our civilization represses or oppresses. It's re-emergence dramatized, as in our nightmares, as an object of horror, a matter for terror. The happy ending, when it exists, typically signifying the restoration of repression. Benshoff compares the transition from movie world to real world to Halloween, the holiday, which allows otherwise normal people the pleasures of drag or monstrosity for a brief but exhilarating experience. At the end of the night, or at the end of the movie, while straight participants in such experiences usually return to their daylight worlds, both the monster and the homosexual are permanent residents of shadowy spaces. At worst, caves, castles, and closets, and at best, a marginalized and oppressed position within the cultural hegemony. At least with our one-off slasher, we know that the return of the status quo is temporary, that the monster will come back. So I think this is why I feel so much resistance to the idea of a larger narrative placed over this franchise, something that could culminate in a true end for Michael of a closing of possibility. Of course, even if this trilogy ends, it can always be picked up again, so I don't want to sound too alarmist. But in movie world, my preference is for the all the teens died and the monsters retreated until next time kind of an ending. I want another world to remain a possibility. On this dividing line, we can judge movies from the last 50 years or so in modern versus postmodern terms. Now these words are used across disciplines and don't always carry any consistent meaning, but 
Hart and Negri in their 2004 book Multitude, War and Democracy in the Age of Empire, some of the distinction between the two in a way that I really like, and this is how I'll be using them. What really divides them is that modernists want to protect or resurrect the traditional social bodies and postmodernists accept or even celebrate their dissolution. Hart and Negri point to nostalgia as a roadblock to this willingness to let go, and since 2004, being critical of our impulses toward nostalgia has only become more important on both the macro scale of global politics and the micro scale of media cycles. On both fronts, an alternative to our current situation is feeling less and less likely, which is not to take a fundamentally anti nostalgia nostalgia stands. I mean, clearly I've surrounded myself with the material culture of nostalgia, but nostalgia can't be our primary driving force into the future without closing ourselves off from real change. Halloween 1978 was made at the close of a period where the attainability of another world may be felt more possible than it has ever since. If we turn back to the setting of the movie as one of domestic fear, the politicization of the home was on center stage in the preceding years. Movements of the past decade had been marked by the slogan, The Personal is Political, and Sylvia Federici's essays, Wages Against Housework, Why Sexuality is Work, and Counterplanning from the Kitchen were all released in 1975. Federici concludes a preface to the 2011 collection of these essays, Revolution at Point Zero, Housework, Reproduction, and the Feminist Struggle, by remarking, It is through the day-to-day -day activities by means of which we produce our existence that we can develop our capacity to cooperate and not only resist our dehumanization, but learn to reconstruct the world as a space of nurturing and creativity and care. Now, the reconstruction of the day-to-day -day is at the heart of much of the slasher genre. I mean, we all have a lot of fondness for the first 20 minutes or so of these movies before any of the horror starts. Now, I wish I could have five hours of these guys planning the Valentine's Day dance in 1981's My Bloody Valentine. The Halloween movies, excepting maybe the Cult of Thorn-centric part six, are all about the everyday. Whether one's everyday looks more like John Carpenter's or Rob Zombie's is beside the point. And I guess if you grew up in a cult, Halloween 6 might not be an outlier either. Much of the rewatchability of the original Halloween comes from scenes without Michael Myers. The suburban fantasy of fall in Pasadena is enchanting. Is there something larger playing out on some level in the 2018 storyline if we take Michael to be a reaction to the cultural forces of the 70s? I'm filming this as Roe v. Wade was just overturned, housework is still gendered, the dream of the 80s for women to work simultaneously in and out of the home has certainly been a more enduring force than anything Federici fought for. So there may be a good reason why the domestic horror of the Halloween series still resonates. After all, Michael's iconic weapon is a kitchen knife. In part six, where the Strodes are living in the Myers house, he uses the tools of domesticity back in his own home to dispatch them via the washing machine and clothesline. This is a reversal of Laurie's straightened out hanger and knitting needle in the original. Now I'm not saying it's a purposeful reversal, but it's something to note. Speaking of domestic fantasy, family dynamics are at the heart of this franchise and the cultural issues of each movie's particular contemporary moment. This was not coming out of nowhere in 1978. Four years earlier, Texas Chainsaw Massacre had introduced us to the uppercase family, and preceding that were the Manson family murders. The media of the next generation would obsessively process this struggle. If we look at the ensuing moral panics around stranger danger, Satanists, and violence on television, the winding pathway of this franchise turns out to make more sense. We can see in it the evolving fears of the American family. So let's look at the family in this franchise. Typically, what the movie has to say about the idea of the family is echoed in some way in how the characters talk about Michael's motivations. Originally, Michael kills his sister in some confused sense of betrayal after watching her boyfriend kiss her with Michael's own clown mask. In Halloween 2, Lori, the new object of Michael's gaze, is revealed to be his sister. Michael breaks into a school and stabs a child's drawing of a happy family. Halloween 4 is the story of Lori's daughter, Michael's niece Jamie. Jamie's insecure about her position in her adoptive family and is teased at school for who her uncle is and for being an orphan. She's targeted by Michael, who is now defined apparently by his desire to kill any known family. The movie ends on a scene of her channeling Michael and stabbing her adoptive mother. The cycle of violence continues. Halloween 5 gives Jamie and Michael a moment together that is virtually impossible to understand in the context of the other films, but is also one of my favorite scenes in this series. Just like me. Halloween 6 has a few family centric storylines. We have Michael and Jamie and Jamie's baby, of course, but we also have Lori's cousin Kara. 
We have the breakdown of the traditional family as she's moved back in with her parents and her son with no husband or partner. Meanwhile, we have the Howard Stern character invading the small town, a classic look at crass new media versus the innocent heartland. The secret goal of the Cult of Thorn has something to do with raising a child to sacrifice, a scapegoat to prevent evil from spreading to the larger community. So a lot going on there. And while family values are politically very important in our current time, culturally they're nowhere near as relevant as they were 20 years ago. Though maybe this is changing again with the Disneyfication of mass sections of our media. Brushing aside the actual plot points of Halloween 6, this conflict is definitely what stands out the most to me. Well, that and Paul Rudd's performance just a joy to watch. Halloween 7 follows the relationship of Lori and her 17-year-old son. As generally happened, she's overcompensated for her own childhood and managed to push her son away in an effort to protect him. Halloween 8 starts with Lori as Michael held in a mental hospital and falling to the ground in a mirror of Michael's original death. The reality TV show we spend the movie on fictionalizes an abusive family for Michael's backstory as a way of explaining his actions. This jokey backstory is taken a lot more seriously in the next two movies, so... Let's move on to Halloween uh, 1 and 2 by Rob Zombie. So there's a long history of reimagining a familiar story from the monster's point of view, the monstrous gaze. If, um, if that's not a term, then I'm coining it. The first and most terrifying monster in English literature from the great early epic Beowulf tells his own side of the story in a book that William Gass called one of the finest of our contemporary fictions. Grendel was written in 1971 and came to mind initially because of its horror movie levels of gleeful violence, but of course there are plenty of older stories in this tradition. Through the evolution of horror, we can see the role of the monster as other move toward the monster as ourselves. Hart and Negri look at this through the function of the vampire in fiction, as originally it represented excessive sexuality. Its desire for flesh is insatiable, and its erotic bite strikes men and women equally, undermining the order of heterosexual coupling. The vampire undermines the reproductive order of the family with its own alternative mechanism of reproduction. New vampires are created by the bite of both male and female vampires, forming an eternal race of the undead. The vampire thus functions in the social imagination as one figure of a monstrosity, of a society which the traditional social bodies, such as the family, are breaking down. It should come as no surprise, then, that vampires have become so prevalent in recent years in popular novels, film, and television. Grendel follows the thoughts and pain of the monster that Beowulf, in the early epic Beowulf, travels across the ocean to defeat. In Grendel, the monster begins young, exploring the world and seeking to understand his place in it. He can't help but spy on the world of men obsessively once he realizes that they exist. He watches them play out hypocritical scenes of honor and vengeance over the years. Occasionally, he attacks, eating his way through the supply of warriors and vanishing back into the night. He listens to songs of the king's legacy, which identify him as evil, as the villain. In his search for some meaning to cut through the overwhelming doom and meaninglessness of life, he even wants to believe what he knows to be a lie. That the king is noble and acts with God's will, even when, as an outsider, he's seen that the king is as weak and flawed as all other men. More importantly, he wants to believe in the structure, even though he would necessarily be the monster of the story. Through Grendel's eyes and his vacillations through nihilism, hedonistic violence, self-righteous retribution, and desire for religious structure, we see the lie of black and white morality, of good and evil, civilization, and the monstrous. Grendel's life as a monster becomes a treatise on the nature of morality and meaning. He sees through the facade of honor and nobility, even while feeling outcasted by internalizations of that same narrative. His desire to believe in the systems of meaning posed by civilization is at odds with his own place in that system. He wants to believe in it even if it makes his own existence wretched. He's constantly changing his mind on what would or would not be meaningful, falling into violent nihilism and then further, realizing the meaninglessness of his vengeance on the world that shuns him. He echoes an earlier reading of Michael as a life based on exclusion in his declaration, I am lack. While Grendel, as John Gardner imagined him, doesn't really match up to Michael, he's kind of full of like a wailing angst, I still think that he's a very relevant example. Plus, Michael's full of incongruous personality, alternating blankness and humor, and Grendel lets us step inside the possible mind of a monster acting with limited language. Grendel looks at his place in the world of Beowulf and thinks to himself, I understood that the world was nothing, a mechanical chaos of casual brute enmity on which we stupidly impose our hopes and fears. I understood that finally and absolutely I alone exist. 
All the rest I saw is merely what pushes me or what I push against blindly, as blindly as all that is not myself pushes back. I create the whole universe blink by blink, an ugly god pitifully dying in a tree. Grendel's stuck in a tree at this point, but don't worry. He escapes and lives long enough to be killed by Beowulf, as anyone entering the story probably knows is going to happen. In that way, it's honestly not unlike watching a slasher, where you are growing to care about these characters that you've accepted from the outset are going to die terribly. All that's to say, Rob Zombie was not just being early 2000s edgy in his sympathy with the monster. Grendel allows us to look at our culture and moralism from an outsider's point of view. And it's not really our culture, but the mythologizing of Scandinavian history is certainly relevant in our age of weirdo, alpha masculine, white nationalists. Grendel comes from 1960s U.S. university culture, and John Grendel adds plenty of contemporary political thought. I mean, Grendel overhears an old man tell a prince, the state is an organization of violence, a monopoly in what it is pleased to call legitimate violence. Revolution is not the substitution of immoral for moral or of illegitimate for legitimate violence. It is simply the pitting of power against power, where the issue is freedom for the winners and enslavement of the rest. Anachronistic articulations of state aside, it's pretty clear that Gardner is looking at the cycles of history and the ambivalence of violent acts in a very real sense throughout the book. Grendel is emblematic of a relevant framework through which we can see the potential of looking monstrosity in the eye, because the way that we present moralism via fighting our cultural monsters is very telling. Asa Simon Mittman identifies the effect of the monster as rooted in the vertigo of redefining one's understanding of the world. He explains, The monstrous is that which creates this sense of vertigo, that which calls into question our epistemological worldview, highlights its fragmentary and inadequate nature, and thereby asks us, often with fangs at our throats, with its fire upon our skin, even as we in our stand-ins and body doubles descend the gullet, to acknowledge the failures of our systems of categorization. One trigger for the feeling of horror, then, can be this category crisis. It can be linked to morality and politics, as in Grendel, or it can be the simple unease of someone who should be dead standing back up. So, let's go forward to 2007, just for a minute. I don't have any great love for Rob Zombie's style. White Zombie was never my thing. Back when I was in my preteen goth phase, I think I was too depressed and self-serious to get into whatever this is. Though these aren't my favorite Halloween films, I do always feel some reflex to defend them. I think a lot of hate comes toward him. I think a lot of hate toward him comes from the general cringe we feel towards someone who presents themselves as really weird and out there, which I get but I'm also trying to cringe less, to just enjoy that someone takes the thing that they like seriously, so let's just set that aspect aside, because there's also a middle-class hand-wringing involved in rejecting his movies, and that's kind of what I take issue with. There's a discomfort people feel with the human element of his characters that his critics don't always feel toward the well-off villains of other equally exploitative horror. There's plenty of fair criticism, and like I said, these aren't my favorite movies, but they do split people down a dividing line of people who have lived under the weight of cruel systems and cruel people, and those who, due to their distance from those life experiences, think that there's no truth to the unrelenting bleakness he puts on screen, that it's shock value for shock value's sake. I also like that you can take what Zombie said about his childhood and understand where the aesthetics of his cinematic universe come from. It's like when you listen to The Violent Femmes and you're like, how does this cut so deeply to the heart of some dark Americana? And then you find out that Gordon Gano grew up in Connecticut with an actor father who then moved them to Backwoods, Wisconsin and became a Baptist preacher. And you're like, oh, that's how. Oh, Rob Zombie spent his childhood working at carnivals and escaping through nonstop TV and movies. I get it. Rain Wilson in the behind the scenes for House of a Thousand Corpses says that the movie allows the viewer to see the inner workings of Zombie's brain become unglued. This can be a strength and a weakness. Chris Alexander, in a 2007 issue of Rue Morgue, which interviewed Zombie when his Halloween movie was coming out, put it succinctly. Rob Zombie truly does live, and will no doubt die, by the pop culture sword he swings so heavily. Now, I don't personally find Rob Zombie's art as revealing of something true or profound about American violence as I do Gordon Gano's, but I do think it's effective. There are a lot of zombie fans. When I went to see Halloween Kills, the person in front of me at the bar told the bartender that their favorite Halloween movies were the zombie ones, and hearing that made me want to go back and rewatch them, see what I was missing. There is something to them that speaks to a lot of people for a reason, something that Halloween Kills is incapable of engaging with. Bad taste is the petrol that drives the American dream. 
And this distancing from human darkness is what defangs a lot of media that was created in response to Trump. Kills, as we'll see in a moment, examines the darkness from a place of knowing better. It isn't true darkness being wrestled with, it's taking the complexity of the past few years and compressing it into something simple. There are authorities who are trained. There's a system. Well, the system failed. And my exhaustion sitting through kills, I think did give me a greater appreciation for what Rob Zombie did with the franchise. Plus, he made a movie with both Brad Dwarf and Weird Al, so I really personally don't have anything to complain about. I'll happily watch Brad Dwarf in anything, and the simple bravery to put the Mike versus Michael Myers joke into a movie just has to be applauded. I'm a little confused. Are, are we talking about the, uh, the Austin Powers Mike Myers? Or... Let's move on to the current iteration of Michael Myers. So there's a little bit of the Black Christmas problem with these new movies. The conviction that because time has progressed, we have inherently become more progressive. The original 1974 Black Christmas is one of the most effective movies I've ever seen. It's one where if I put it on, once it's over, I start it at the beginning and spend the day watching it on a loop because I just can't turn it off. The women of the original are still so timeless and their problems are still so relevant today that the remake, which sets itself up to be explicitly feminist to make a point, feels comparatively hollow. The 70s were not the dark ages, progress is not linear, and a movie made now is not always more enlightened than a movie from the past. We could digress here and talk about how even the literal dark ages were not the dark ages, but the projection of ignorance and brutishness by later people into the past, but instead let's look at a movie made now, or now-ish. 2018 feels like a true lifetime ago. Outside of Lori, Halloween 2018 is marked by a desire of the people of Haddonfield to reject Michael. For the rest of the town, Michael only lives in Lori. She's bumming everyone out, and they're sick of it. Say goodbye to Michael and get over it. This brings us back to Julia Kristeva's definition of the abject as something rejected from which one does not part. We will see this futility of trying to reject Michael play out in this movie and in Halloween Kills. In the original Halloween, Michael is already an abject creature. He's a shape the boogeyman, pure evil rather than a character. Per Kristeva, the abject is not an object facing me, which I name or imagine. Michael, in his immortality as the shape rather than a person, can never be excised from us. What we end up with in a case of the abject is that pulling at the seams of what frightens and repulses us only makes the whole bigger. Back to Kristeva, I object myself within the same motion through which I claim to establish myself. We see the abject in Lori at the start of Halloween 2018, defined again by Kristeva as a deep well of memory that is unapproachable and intimate. And we will see it again in Halloween Kills. If monsters are products of their moment in time, as Michael is a product of the 70s, then what does it mean to move a monster temporally? Are we inheriting the fears of the past? Do they seem quaint and unthreatening? Halloween 2018 seems to think so. Wasn't it her brother who like cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. What then is scary in 2018? These new movies were conceived during the height of fascist and white supremacist visibility in the US in our time. And these movies do intend to speak to the present. Jamie Lee Curtis said, once again, David Gordon Green is prescient. The Me Too movement, those brave women who first spoke to Ronan Farrow happened at the beginning of October of 2017. But Halloween 2018 was written way before that. So they were prescient about female trauma, and in Halloween Kills, they were prescient about the mob violence, the uprisings, the civil unrest, the people taking matters into their own hands, the I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore idea, and the system is broken conversation. We made this movie a long time ago, and there's even a hint of police misconduct in the recreations of the 1978 sequences. Shane Burley, introducing his 2021 collection, Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse, writes, From sea to shining sea, it is, well, not exactly a new world, but more of a hyper-real reenactment of the old one. This comment on the return to nationalism sweeping the planet from 2015 to the present can easily find a mirror in the media of that same period. If not always in the messaging, certainly in the nostalgia and mythologizing of a fictional past and our current obsession with rewriting it via reboots. There was an article by Richard Newby in January's Fangoria called Unfinished Business, which described the horrors of the previous generation as a can kick down the road for the next one to face. 
He writes, we're all left at the mercy of unfinished business as the survival tactics of one generation force death upon the next. This is the subject of contemporary horror. Where does that leave the monster? In his introduction to the American horror film, Robin Wood describes the other as that which bourgeois ideology cannot recognize or accept but must deal with, in one of two ways either by rejecting and if possible annihilating it or by rendering it safe and assimilating it, converting it as far as possible into a replica of itself. In terms of assimilation, we've seen attempts with Freddy. Yeah, I I'm here to help you. Help yourself, fucker! <laughs> and Jason. Together we can, we can make a fortune. We can... While I don't believe we've seen this with Michael outside of Loomis's constant ramblings, I can't imagine it would be successful. So if assimilation doesn't work, then I guess we're left with annihilation. Or... Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! As established, monsters are tied to the society that created them. They carry the anxieties, fears, and repressed feelings of those who give them shape. This means that moving a monster into a different setting can be conceptually problematic. These issues intensify when a work relies heavily on nostalgia, a shift that we can clearly see between Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills. Halloween Kills takes a timely setup of three generations of women dealing with the effects of trauma and shifts the following up on every minor character from the original movie so that we can hear how each of them remember and have been affected by Halloween 78. Our only new characters who don't just die where they stand but actually join in on the mission are not really given any agency in the story or a good storyline. Vanessa and Marcus just get in the car with our old characters and die before getting to do anything. Instead, we have a story about a cop accidentally shooting his partner and then blaming it on Michael and his redemption 40 years later. We have a kid who Laurie protected grew up with a complex where he now wants to be the protector but isn't very good at it. We have Lonnie grow up with the shame around his fear of Michael, leading him to literally drive two children to the place where he's figured out that Michael is. We have a man who is obviously not Michael Myers get mobbed by a frenzied crowd in a painfully didactic scene. We have Lori spend a whole movie in a hospital away from the action, which I thought is what bummed everyone out about Halloween 2, but here we are doing it again. We have a whole movie of conversations where no one seems to remember what was said five minutes ago, and we have a bunch of extended references to the franchise. So in all of this, what did we leave behind? Where 2018 ends on a freeze frame of Allison holding the iconic kitchen knife like a torch being passed, the extended version of Kills ends on a freeze frame of Lori holding the same knife. I think that this detail is very telling. A large portion of this movie instead centers on the Tivoli scene, where the second escapee from the prison transfer bus wanders into the hospital. Tommy Doyle riles everyone up, and he's chased to his own desperate suicide. Jeffrey Jerome Cohen cites Bakhtin's official culture as the subject that transfers all that is viewed as undesirable in itself into the body of the monster. This scapegoating, what Cohen calls a wish-fulfillment drama being enacted by the culture, is clear in Tivoli's scene. Cohen continues that the scapegoated monster, which can be read in Kills as both Tivoli and Michael, is ritually destroyed in the course of some official narrative, purging the community by eliminating its sins. Despite how prolonged and confusing the Tivoli scene is, it doesn't actually mean anything in the larger narrative of the movie. It has moved on from quickly once it served its purpose. Tommy just says he made a mistake and he and Judy Greer walk away. Both characters are killed shortly after and Michael, the real Michael this time, is trapped and mobbed by Tommy and other Haddonfieldians so no one's even moving on from the scene changed. This was put here to make a weird statement about mob mentality and protesting. The reality of it being interspersed with the narrative of a cop being justified in covering up a shooting is odd to say the least. So what is the point of view of Halloween Kills? Monsters can reveal things about our characters and how they react or in how the monster sees our character as other, as opposed to the traditional view of the monster as other. We get more of the Grendel sense of Haddonfield in the original Halloween, where we are voyeurs of the scene alongside Michael. And given the emphasis on removing Michael's mask and kills, it feels odd that this is the direction it goes. We look at ourselves from the point of view of someone only treated as a monster. Tuvoli in the aforementioned worst scene of the movie, but we don't get any closer to Michael or the shortcomings of the society affected by him. And I'm not calling for any like elevated horror kind of look at Michael and like understanding the source of his trauma or anything. I just, if a movie's asking to be taken seriously, I think it's fair to look at what it's saying. 
While presenting itself implicitly as an analog for America during Trump's presidency, it is so surface level that it seems afraid to reckon with Michael himself. Carol Clover describes the effect of the opening of Halloween 1978. We are belatedly revealed to ourselves after committing a murder in the cinematic first person. Where do we sit in Halloween Kills? This question of cinematic language leads us to a film that's ultimately regressive despite appearances because of its unwillingness to face the monster. While a lot is made of removing Michael's mask and attempting to identify the source of his power, we don't get any closer to him. Robin Wood wrote of the designation of the monster as simply evil that insofar as horror films are typical manifestations of our culture, the dominant designation of the monster must necessarily be evil. What is repressed in the individual in the culture must always return as a threat, perceived by the consciousness as ugly, terrible, obscene. Horror films, it might be said, are progressive precisely to the degree that they refuse to be satisfied with this simple designation. A disappointment of this movie, then, is that it set up a vehicle for exploring current fears and then abandoned that in favor of just living out a nostalgia fantasy. I'm not sure what the impetus for this is. Maybe it's its own form of temporal horror. Fear of mortality and irrelevance driving aging fans to hold tight to the franchise is important to us. To turn quick reference into prolonged set piece, Maybe like Scream 5 suggests, some of the horror of our time can be brought to light by interrogating fan culture. If so, maybe Halloween Kills is a more incisive piece of current horror than I give it credit for. It's becoming increasingly relevant to question how effective works coming from a place of fandom can be. Not only is Michael confused by not being of this time, but his world is constrained by having to be referential. It's limited to what we saw in the original because now out of love we're being asked, why have a set piece that works on its own strength when it could be a reference? This also detracts from Kill's effectiveness as a horror movie. It is fully lacking in the uncanny. We don't have any familiar grounding situations or characters here to define Michael as alien. Everyone has already been exposed, as it were, to horror. Every scene where we could expect to have normality interrupted by Michael starts with knowledge of him. This compulsion to explain the franchise at every juncture detracts from the suspension of belief that the movie creates. I mean, I really just wanted to watch the open mic night and get to know these townspeople. The thing is, I'm not anti-reboot. I'm excited to go see Halloween Ends in theaters. It feels like an event in the way that just going to see a normal movie wouldn't. But with fan creations, we often see a tendency toward finalism, where characters, plots, and set pieces are motivated by a desired end product as opposed to the ending being motivated by any logical narrative. It feels like Kills was constructed backwards. Things happen not because there's any kind of logic or character drive, but because there's an end point we have to reach. A lot of love went into this movie, but that may be part of the problem. The world is shrunk by the glut of references rather than expanded. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock, in his introduction to the monster theory reader, writes, Is something still a monster if one believes in its existence and has a category to define it? Maybe this is the issue with unmasking the monster. The monster is always changing and so are we. While I understand the drive to take characters and franchises we love and tell our own stories through them, maybe our slasher favorites aren't a good fit for these big stories. Maybe they should live forever in one-offs where the specifics of the time are always changing, and the fears that Michael represents and our identities as Michael's other are always evolving. Maybe the failure, because I do think that Kills fails, is in using an ever-changing character to tell a very time-specific story. This is an example of how quickly things become outdated, and a good monster, in their ability to always be current, makes it more obvious when something exists outside of its time. There's something about monsters where we try to look at them and get a hold of what they mean, but that meaning so quickly manages to escape us, and we're in the end left unsatisfied. A lot of recent horror has been focused on the question of living post-monster, of generational hurt, and how the past is still haunting us. The Halloween reboots feel behind on the times. So it's very convenient for me that the next movie is called Halloween Ends. An underlying anxiety fueling our culture right now on all sides is a sense of doom and collapse, a concern with the end times. Eschatology is a part of theology focused on the end times, and millennialism is a belief system that looks forward to this end as a period of redemption and paradise on earth. The history of the United States is certainly one of religious cultism and obsession with preparing for this collapse. This has graduated beyond a religious foundation into what Michael Barkin calls improvisational millennialism. Shane Burley writes, Secular millennialism has led to a shifting sand of apocalypticism in the American mind. 
sometimes religious, sometimes only seeming religious, and oftentimes disconnected from even the last fragments of coherent ideology. In the 20th century, apocalypticism went into overdrive as people began picking and choosing how they built this road to the end. A little bit Christian theology, some UFO stories, mix in a secret government, and add a dose of crystal healing. Of course, we're all on some level aware of the real collapse that's coming, one which I, and no one I know, is capable of thinking about directly. And so instead, our anxiety and doom are sublimated and bubble up in other places. Burley sums up the scientific promises of the next few years, the non-religiously deluded, non-paranoid timeline of what we are careening toward. The atmosphere will become toxic, heat-related deaths will rise, as will the oceans, and a mass die-off will take most of the planet's life. We are entering a period where fish will mostly go extinct, where wildfires will consume more and more vegetation each year, and where wars will rage over who controls water. I think this knowledge is the unspoken, unthought tension defining our current media. And as always, there's comfort in the collapse. I spent the earlier phases of the pandemic watching the Mad Max movies almost daily and playing alternating fallout titles. Media that didn't center on collapse was only a reminder of how unwilling we are to acknowledge death and stressed me out way more. Focus on collapse serves another function. Burley writes, Millennialism imbues our actions with significance. The sense that even the mundane is sacred because of its proximity to our culmination. Burley's not writing about horror, but he unlocks something for me in how endlessly interesting it feels to talk about these movies. Every small detail of daily life feels important in such close quarters with unstoppable death. Further, looking at Halloween Kills is how our present moment has been filtered through film. Burley's pinning down of our current position as a politics of decadence founded in the aesthetics of decline, the ruinous space of empire's past, and the nostalgia for an earlier time, and this being where fascism rests its entire identity, on symbols that in their decline have been made aesthetic once again, brought to mind the burnt mask. Michael's mask in kills is certainly an identity symbolized by ruin. To requote Kristeva, the abject is the violence of mourning for an object that has always already been lost. But it's not only Michael that's defined by an aesthetics of decline. The shift in Halloween Kills is toward a cast of characters defined by their retelling of the past. As with real-world fascism, the stories that they tell about these pasts are ones that express their hopes for the future, not a place they can actually return to. In this way, the characters retelling the story of the moment of rupture where Michael returned to Haddonfield, where nothing exciting ever happened, are also playing out a fascistic form of myth-making. Now, I'm not accusing the people of Haddonfield, or even Michael Myers, of being some secret fascist. But I do think as much as the ideology of psychoanalysis was ingrained in the pop culture of the 70s, impulses toward fascism define the present. Our culture is currently inundated with fascistic logic and themes. While this movie purposefully attempted to narratively reflect our times, I think the real reflection is more mechanical and unconscious. Amid all this doom and gloom, monsters present an alternative. Burley notes that apocalypse does not actually mean the end, but comes from the Greek word for revelation or a disclosure, meaning the disclosure of what is to come. Burley's hope for the future, then, comes from embracing apocalypticism. To decide fully and completely the old world is dead, not because the rich killed it with their hubris, but because we did. Let's reframe this via the monster. Hart and Negri write, The monster is not an accident, but the ever-present possibility that can destroy the natural order of authority in all domains. The monster will always escape us because in understanding it, we would be transgressing this natural order and it would no longer be monstrous. John Gardner's Grendel hardly feels like the monster of Beowulf by the time their meeting occurs. Understanding the other usually means decentering our own idea of normality. So maybe in the face of secular millennialism, we can come to a secular apocalypticism. Bringing this back to Halloween Kills, is the disavowal of society's monsters really going to bring us to a better future? It seems like we're at a place culturally where we feel like we have all the answers, where we know what's right and wrong and how to understand the world. If the monster does ask us why we made it, maybe we aren't ready to answer that question yet. Halloween Kills is trapped in its fear of getting too close to Michael. If, as the movie establishes itself to be, Kills is meant to speak to larger issues of our time, are we supposed to be rooting for a return to the status quo and ends? Jack Halberstam links the etymology of monster to the violation of privacy and the comfort of familiar spaces that I would say define the original Halloween. He writes that the monster announces itself, demonstrates, as the place of corruption, adding, the monster will find you in the intimacy of your home. Indeed, it will make your home its home, or you its home, and alter forever the comfort of domestic privacy. 
Maybe like the Myers house, our home was always the monsters to begin with. Okay, uh, thanks for watching. I did post a different video a week ago, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know. Uh, recapping the Halloween movies. So if you want, uh, I guess you can go watch that. I guess I should have mentioned it at the beginning of this video instead of at the end, but um, I didn't really want to advertise it because I've had a concussion during both these videos and they feel very disjointed. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's that good, but <laughs> it's fine. Um, it was just something to do and to finish doing and uh, try out making videos, which I have enjoyed doing. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Go watch it if you want or don't, and that's fine. And uh, yeah, I guess Halloween ends came out yesterday, but I haven't watched it yet, kind of don't want to. <laughs> um, I was avoiding trailers for it, and then hockey started, and so I've been watching a lot of live TV, and I've seen about 500 trailers, and every time one comes on, I just want to see the movie a little less, because it just doesn't look very fun. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe I'll go see it tonight. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> okay, if you want to like or subscribe or the other things, I don't know what else there is, but if you want to do any of that, then cool. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Bye.